The gravitational interaction is unique in several ways. For instance, the gravitational field of a rotating massive charged particle contains information about the particle's mass, charge, and angular momentum, because mass, the electric field, and movement carry energy, which gravitates, while the electric field does not carry information about the particle's mass. Another peculiarity is that gravity, described by general relativity, was the first fundamental relativistic theory that was inherently nonlinear, in contrast to the previous classical electromagnetism of Maxwell in vacuum and Newtonian gravity. This implies that the gravitational field interacts with itself and acts as a source, carrying energy and momentum, and the superposition principle does not hold. The gravitational field cannot just be the sum of individual fields. We will cover the complicated topic of how the gravitational field possesses energy in general relativity, the history of how Einstein tried to introduce it by hand in his field equations, and the long discussions about pseudotensors and energy conservation in a future video. But for now, let's study its nonlinearity. The nonlinearity of gravity does not only become evident in special cases such as black hole merging and emission of gravitational waves. One can tweak a linear approximation to general relativity to fit the anomalous motion of the perihelion advance of Mercury and get the observed arcs per second. But by doing this, one does not get light deflection and redshift correctly. In fact, as shown by Victor Titov, one cannot simply explain Mercury's orbit with the linearized approximation to general relativity. Even though the gravitational potential near the Sun is far from what we consider a strong gravity, which would require the gravitational potential to approach the orders of magnitude of the speed of light squared, nonlinear effects already kick in here. I will leave Victor's blog post with the proof in the description, and if you want to learn about linearized general relativity, check out our previous video on gravitoelectromagnetism called How General Relativity Fails to Explain Galaxy Dynamics. Another example in which Newtonian gravity fails to reproduce observations in the solar system is the light bending of the Sun. One can also get the light deflection correctly by tweaking the linear general relativity approximation, but cannot get also redshift and Mercury's perihelion shift correctly with it. Before general relativity was finalized, Einstein guessed in 1911 that if gravity affects time, then light traveling near a massive body would change direction. He calculated the deflection angle of light passing by the Sun to be 2 times the gravitational constant times the mass divided by the radius and c squared of around 0 0.85 arc seconds. And in 1915, he gave the general relativity prediction of 4 times the gravitational constant times the mass divided by radius and c squared of around 1.75 arc seconds, which is the observed one. But how did he get half the correct value in the first place? With Newtonian gravity and his equivalence principle, he treated light as a fast particle and being bent just because clock sticks lower deeper in a gravitational potential, which is a linear effect. Curiously, as Victor demonstrates in another blog post, the full general relativity prediction comes from the spatial curvature. It is because of the presence of a spatial curvature, which has no non-relativistic analog, that the bending of light has the predicted magnitude. It must be stated that the nonlinearity of gravity plays no observable role in the gravitational deflection of light, except in the cases of very strong gravity, such as near black hole event horizons. Out of Einstein's three classical tests of gravity, depending of light, gravitational redshift, and Mercury's perihelium, only the perihelion advance is sensitive to the nonlinearity of gravity. As discussed in our previous video on Machen theories that aim to unify inertia and gravity, these models are inherently linear and non-relativistic. To make them relativistic, one would have to reformulate them using Lorentz invariant quantities that are also relational. However, such quantities exist only for velocities, not for positions. In these theories, the effective gravitational constant is not fixed. It varies according to an integral over the past Lycon volume of the observable universe weight by the matter-energy density divided by the distance from the point where the potential is evaluated. Yet, in a relativistic framework based on curved spacetime, the gravitational constant itself influences the very volume over which it is defined. This introduces an additional complication, which is why we introduce Whitehead's gravitational theory in another video, similar to general relativity but formulated on flat spacetime. It seems like the better we want to model a physical phenomena, the sooner we must introduce nonlinearities in our models to correctly describe observations. 
One may question if linear Newtonian gravity is valid entirely for all non-relativistic regimes with weak gravity and slow velocities as a good approximation. We explain modified Newtonian dynamics mode in our previous video and how impressive it is that that simple modification to Newton's laws introducing a single new constant can generally remove the need for dark matter in galaxies at these regimes. Mond is necessarily a non-linear theory, and this is imposed by observations. In Mond, we are not allowed to ignore the external field of a mother system, for instance a galaxy, when dealing with the internal dynamics of a subsystem, for instance a white binary star system in the galaxy. It's the total acceleration or total gravitational field intensity at the spatial point of interest, defined with respect to an absolute frame in Magia Mond, the one in which the mass distribution of the universe is at rest, which enters the Mond equation, and superposition does not hold. A counterintuitive effect follows from this nonlinearity in Mond. A star, which has high accelerations around its surrounding space, is Newtonian, but can move in a Milgromian way around the galaxy if the acceleration exerted by the galaxy is low enough. This is a rigorous mathematical consequence in Mond, and it is required by observations. An analogous case happens in general relativity, where a system can be highly relativistic, such as the merging of two black holes, but move Newtonianly sufficiently far away from a larger mass such as a galaxy. The nonlinearity of Mond makes it difficult to find the fundamental theory from which it emerges as an approximation, and perhaps hints that one should work directly with a relativistic theory to find it. Thank you very much, and see you next time here in Independent Physics.